The organ is among the oldest of all instruments. Early organs, called hydrali, operated on water pressure, which was used to raise the wind pressure. Early examples of these instruments date as far back as 120 BC in the Greek town of Alexandria. Later, the Romans had an improved hydrolysis, which they used in the reign of Nero between 54 and 68 AD. The first recorded use of the organ in a church service comes in 757 AD, so it's been around a while. In 1766, the French monk Francois Bedos de Selle decided to write a complete account of organ building. And in his treatise, we find information that's still used today in the art of organ building. He says the organ is a wind instrument, the largest and richest of all, by virtue of its range, the number of its registers, and the variety of its tones. It comprises a large number of pipes of various kinds, some of tin, others of lead, and still others of wood. The making of this instrument is called organ building, the craftsman is called the organ builder, and the performer on the organ is called the organist. First Lutheran's Casavan organ was completed in June of 2003. So now at 13 years old, it's the youngest of the instruments in Colorado Springs. And it replaced an earlier organ by Dewey Layton, who was a Colorado Springs organ builder. One of the challenges that Joan Keane and Evan Becker, our former organist, gave to the organ builders who submitted bids was that the new instrument needed to take up less space in the choir loft than the former instrument. And Cassavant was able to very cleverly fit this instrument in here, uh, partially due to a renovation of the choir loft that took place at the same time. But it really is a very clever design and manages to put in 41 ranks, or 41 different sets of pipes, which is a, a good size. There's about 2,500 pipes in the organ, and it actually does take up less space than the older instrument, which was smaller. It's all behind the case here, which is really only about seven feet deep, but it is very wide, spanning the full 44-foot width of the church. Since the organ is a wind instrument, we need a blower to raise the wind pressure to cause the pipes to speak. Early instruments had bellows that were operated by bellows operators, uh, often boys who were paid by the church to pump the organ. And this meant that organists rarely could practice at church because you had to pay the pumper. In the Victorian period, it became fashionable to use something called a water motor which was a, a turbine which was spun by the domestic water supply. This did raise the pressure, but if the organist forgot to turn off the, the water motor, then you could have quite a water bill that month for the church. Fortunately, with the advent of electricity, organ builders began using rotary turbines called blowers to raise the wind. Let's take a look in the blower room. This is the blower of the first Lutheran instrument. The motor in the foreground spins a single stage of fan blades in the large housing. The wind then is routed through this wind trunk and the flexible material helps to eliminate any churning action from the blower. From there, the wind is stored in this initial reservoir, which is a large wooden box with a top that can move up and down it is kept under tension by springs so that a certain pressure can be maintained for the instrument. From this first reservoir, the wind goes through this large soldered wind trunk, which runs all the way up to the choir loft where it enters the organ.
The console of the organ is the control center for the organist. Our organ has three keyboards and a keyboard for the feet called the pedal board. It has stops or controls for adjusting which sounds are playing. And right in the middle it has couplers which allow you to put sounds from one keyboard onto another. The middle keyboard is called the grate and it's considered the principal division of the organ. Its pipes are out in the open and they are designed for supporting congregational singing, playing postludes. Other times you need a strong sound. The upper keyboard is called the swell and the pipes of the swell are actually enclosed in a box which we'll see later when we go in the instrument. The lowest keyboard, the choir, is also enclosed and those enclosures allow you to get differences of volume, loud and soft and different gradations in between. Organs can have one, two, three or more keyboards. I'd say that your average church organ has three keyboards. Some larger organs have four, like the instrument at First United Methodist and Grace and St. Stephen's Episcopal. Uh, some of the largest instruments have five, six, and there's even one instrument that has a seven manual console. But the real reason for having so many keyboards is in order to have more sounds ready to go. And with today's computer-controlled uh, preset systems, we really don't need as many manuals because we can make the changes much faster. I think you could argue that four manuals might be the biggest because you could play four manuals with your two hands. As I'm demonstrating here, some pieces call for you to play an accompaniment on one keyboard while reaching down to play a melody on the manual below. The, the sounds or the tonal resources of the organ are controlled by these stop tabs. On some organs, there are knobs on the side. Those are called draw knob consoles. But uh, this design of console was chosen for First Lutheran because it allows you to have a more compact console. And since space is at such a premium in our choir loft, that was a good idea. These stops are for the swell, or the upper keyboard. These stops are for the great, or the middle keyboard. These stops are for the choir, the lowest keyboard. And these stops are for the pedal, or for your feet to play. And then these tabs in the middle control what are called couplers, which allow you to take the sound from one keyboard and play it on another. For instance, if I put on the four-foot octave on the swell, I can also make it play on the grate, or on the choir, or I could make it play on the grate an octave lower, or an octave higher, or maybe all three. So you can see these are aids to the organist that give you a great deal of flexibility with how you use the sounds of the instrument. Now generally speaking, one stop corresponds to one set of pipes. So if I put on that same four foot octave and play a scale, if I go all the way to the top of the keyboard, which is 61 notes, you would have 61 pipes. So there's one pipe for each note and they are all voiced to play with a similar tone quality, and that's called a stop. The set of pipes is called a rank. Some of the ranks play at a pitch that it corresponds with piano pitch. So if, for instance, I put on the eight-foot principle on the swell, then middle C is the same frequency as middle C would be on the piano. But one of the interesting things about the organ is that we have stops at other pitch levels too. So in addition to having my middle C in the 8-foot stop, I could add a 4-foot stop, which speaks an octave higher. I could also add a 2-foot stop, which speaks 2 octaves higher. And a 1-foot stop would speak 3 octaves higher. We also have some stops that don't speak at the pitch you're playing. So for instance, if I draw the two and two thirds and play a C, you actually hear a G. The one and three fifths, when I play a C, you hear an E. 
But if I combine those off unison pitches, the two and two thirds, the one and three fifths, with an eight, a four, and a two, that means we have five pipes speaking for every note. Now you have an interesting new sound. And that particular sound is called a cornet and was used a lot in French organ music. Some stops control multiple ranks of pipes, and these are generally what we call mixtures. They are stops that are high-pitched, and they're supposed to add to the brilliance of the organ. So when I put on the mixture and I play a single note, uh, in this case you'll actually hear three pipes. It's playing a C, a G, and a C. And as you go up the scale, you hear that continue. Great, there's a mixture that plays four pipes. The organ also has stops that play an octave lower than the piano. So, for instance, here's that same middle C. A 16 foot stop is an octave lower, and a 32 foot stop would be two octaves lower. Usually we use 16-foot stops for the pedals, and there they provide that uh, sort of rich underpinning of the bass line. The organ stops fall into a, a certain number of families that kind of broadly characterize their sound. So the backbone of organ tone is a stop called the diapason, or the principal. And we have a number of those. This is the main one. And we have that at four foot. And two foot. And the mixture is actually also made up of principal pipes. Then on the choir, we have principles at four. And two. And on the swell, we have eight and four. So you can hear they're similar, but they have slightly different tone qualities, which helps to give the organ a very interesting sound. Then we have a family of flute stops, and they come in several flavors. So we have flutes that are open, like a harmonic flute. We have another harmonic flute on the choir and on the swell. Flutes can also be stopped or closed. Or they can be partially open, like the chimney flute. Or they can be tapered, so the body of the pipe does this. Or they can have a, a hat, uh, like the spindle flute. And then there's also a family that we call string family. These are pipes that are narrower that make a, a sound that's kind of suggestive of a string instrument, the viola da gamba. And if you combine that with another set of string pipes that's tuned a little bit sharp, then you get a sound that's suggestive of a, a whole string orchestra. We also have some strings on the choir. And then we come to the reed stops. The basic reed stop is essentially a trumpet sound, so we have a big trumpet on the grate, a smaller trumpet on the swell, and we have a trombone in the pedal. Then we have an oboe stop, 
which does sound a little bit like an oboe. The oboe is carried down into a lower octave to become the bassoon. And then, as you'll see inside the organ, we also have a stop called the crumb horn, which is a predecessor of the clarinet. The control systems for today's organs don't require a whole lot of space. In these two cabinets are all of the computers that are necessary to send signals from the console to the actual wind chests. As we head into the organ, the first thing we see appears to be a wall of wood. But actually, these are the 32 pipes of the 16-foot sub-bass, which is one of the lower-pitched stops on the organ. It's played from the pedal keyboard. The shorter pipes are in the front, and the longer pipes are behind them. Now that we've climbed the ladder inside the instrument, we're at a level slightly higher than the heads of the members of the choir. This way, none of the choir blocks the sound of the organ, although sometimes you might wish that they did. This is the division that we call the grate, and if you remember from the console, it's the middle keyboard. So we have a, a number of ranks here. In the foreground are some of the smaller pipes, which have higher pitches, and behind them are some of the larger pipes, which play lower pitches. In fact, some of these shortest pipes in the instrument are really only about the size of a pencil and produce a very high-pitched tone. Here on the chest for the grate we have the treble pipes for the eight-foot principal which is one of the sets of pipes that you can see from the sanctuary floor most of the pipes of this rank are outside of the case, but just a few are in here for the very highest notes. Behind it is the four-foot principle, which speaks an octave higher. Then the pipes of the harmonic flute, which has a beautiful uh, tone that's very similar to an orchestral flute. And then the spitz flute. And as you can see, the pipes of the spitz flute taper a little bit so that they are narrower on the top than they are on the bottom. And then there's a two-foot principle which speaks two octaves above the note you're playing. And then the four-rank mixture, which is one of those stops that has multiple ranks. One of those stops that plays a high-pitched chord when you play it. The pipes of the harmonic flute are interesting because they're twice as long as they should be to produce a given pitch. And that small hole that you can see drilled into the pipe causes the pipe to jump up an octave, almost like if you play a recorder too hard. And uh, that causes the pitch to be not only higher, but for the tone quality to be more interesting and to have a, a greater complexity. This is the lowest pipe of the eight-foot principle which again is the stop that you can see from the sanctuary floor. The lowest pipe didn't really have a home in the front of the organ, so it's here inside the, the case. And at the very top, so that it doesn't hit the ceiling, it's mitered, which means that the pipe has been tipped over onto itself just to save space. We also have a stop called the chimney flute, and I guess you can see why it's called the chimney flute. Organ pipes cannot change volume on their own, so in order to get loud and soft and contrasts, some of the pipes are placed into wooden boxes that are called swell enclosures, 
And then on the front of the box, we have a set of shades that work a lot like Venetian blinds. They can be opened or closed, and that affects how loud that stop seems. So if you were inside the swell box, you wouldn't hear a change of volume. But once you're outside the swell box, then there's a big effect. Let's see what happens when, at the console, you move the swell pedal. Now I'm in the swell box. You can see just a few of the pipes behind me. These are some of the pipes of the swell division. This rank at the very back of the chamber is narrower than its neighbor, and that's because narrow pipes produce a tone that's more suggestive of a string instrument. And so this is one of the stops that we call a string stop. In front of it is an eight-foot principal, and then a flute that's actually completely covered with a cap. And these pipes only need to be half as long as if they were open, because when you cap the pipe, it speaks an octave lower. Then there is the other of the pair of strings. This is the viola da gamba. And there's a four-foot octave. It speaks an octave higher. And a very unusual shaped flute. This is the spindle flute, sometimes called a copple flute. It has a, a partially open top, but unlike the roar flute, it's not a chimney, it's this uh, conical cap. And we have some upper work, uh, some flutes, a two-foot flute, a one and three-fifths, and another mixture, one of these stops that plays a chord. And right at the front is an eight-foot trumpet, and you can see the support structure that keeps the pipes standing nice and tall so they don't collapse because of their own weight. And then in the distance you can see some of the lower pipes for the swell and also those narrow conical tubes. Those are pipes from the 16-foot bassoon and the 8-foot oboe. Now that we've seen the swell, let's go up to the choir. This is located at the very top of the instrument. Here we are, almost at the choir, and you can see I'm right up next to the ceiling of the sanctuary. Now we're looking into the choir. It's hard to show all the detail because there's a lot packed into this small swell enclosure. In the back, we have another rank that has uh, capped pipes, so they speak an octave lower than their length would suggest. This is the very bottom of the gems horn, which is actually an open pipe, but in order to save space, the very lowest octave changes over to this set of capped pipes, and the tone quality is very similar. It's a, it's a great trick to save space. Then there's a capped flute, which is the Borden. We've got a four-foot harmonic flute and four-foot principal. Some of the higher-pitched pipes tucked away back here. And then an interesting ancient reed sound, actually called a crumb horn, which was a predecessor of the clarinet. Unlike the trumpet, the pipes of the crumb horn just have straight sides. It's like a cylinder. And they come up and they're actually only half as long as you would think. So the pipe is speaking an octave lower than its length. Back on the lower level, we find the lowest octave of the 16-foot Borden from the grate. This is another stopped wooden pipe. The longest pipe is 8 feet long, but it speaks as if it was a 16-foot pipe. and. Um, it's just a little bit smaller and softer than the 16-foot sub-bass on the other side of the instrument. And here I am between the 16-foot Borden and the lowest notes of the 16-foot trombone, which is the strongest of the low pedal stops. 
adds an exciting finish to the post salutes. Here's the very bottom of some of those trombone pipes. They are fully 16 feet long, but in order to fit under the sloping ceiling here, they are kind of cleverly coiled, which is called mitering. So you can see the coils in the pipe, which is much the same as you would find in a tuba or a French horn. Coils to save space. And then the pipe continues up all the way to its top. And now we're looking at the very lowest notes of the trombone. Those pipes are 16 feet long if you could uncoil them. And here I am next to the very end of the lowest note of the 16-foot contrabass. This stop was actually recycled from the older Dewey Layton organ and uh, was revoiced by Cassavant. These are the longest pipes in the instrument. They're 16 feet long, made of wood. Uh, they're about a foot square and uh, really have a powerful low sound. They're laying horizontally underneath the rest of the organ. Hmm. Now which way is out? Before we crawl out, the lower level of the organ has additional reservoirs which store the compressed air for use. It's important for the organ to have a fair bit of storage for the air because a large cord with a lot of pipes playing will quickly deplete the supplies and this would cause the pitch to go flat or to sag if the organ builder hadn't provided an adequate reserve. You may have noticed the rotating star of our organ Zimbelstern, which sounds like uh, small tinkling bells. Here, I'll turn it on. But if you look on the back of the rotating star, there's nothing there. No bells. The bells are actually inside the swell box. Now how many people know that? In the facade of the organ, most of the pipes you see are real speaking pipes. On the north side are pipes from the great eight-foot principle. On the south side are similar pipes from the pedal eight-foot octave. But the five pipes on either end, as well as the five in the middle, are just there for show and they do not play. Well, that concludes our tour of First Lutheran's Casa Vampire.